You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Okay, things the Beatles invented. Concept <laughs> albums, writing room material, stadium gigs, global telecast, bands with no leader, kind of democracy, their own label, all sorts of technical stuff in the studios. Too complicated to, to mention. But it struck me, regarding A Hard Day's Night, <clears throat> that on the 9th of March, 1964, which is 60 years ago, pretty much today, they filmed the sequence uh, where, do you remember, where they, they're they on the train and they record I Should Have Known Better. And it struck me that that could be the first pop video. It could be something else they've invented. It's an amazing sequence. They're on the train, <clears throat> the track starts, and they're just playing cards, aren't they? And they're surrounded by all the other people. And I think Paul's grandfather is there, and um, there's some girls there, some fans, and there's some train staff. And they start doing... The, the the song and then suddenly instruments materialise and they're miming to it and it struck me that it was the kind of blueprint for millions of subsequent videos you know it, it's not a standalone thing like Rain and Paperback Writer <clears throat> so it, it's part mime it's part movie footage but it is a, a self it is a kind of self-contained music video Am I, is there anything in that? I mean, there were there were videos before that, weren't there? There were kind of videos you saw in cinemas. Well, there were there were two sorts of video, and they were mainly played on video jukeboxes. So there are things you can still find on YouTube called soundies that were particularly popular during the Second World War in in the United States. You know, so it would be I don't know Cap Calloway and people like that. Oh, so there's a great um, one of him doing Minnie the Mooch. Isn't there's I've fantastic yeah. sound, really brilliant. And they used to play in video jukeboxes. And then, and then in Europe there was a thing called I think uh, Scopy Tone. Scopy Tone, uh, which did the same thing. But I think Scopy Tone. I looked at some of those. And I think there might be a bit later. There's, there's well, one some that, of them are later. The yeah, Hondells doing Sea yeah. Cruise. Well, that was 1965, so that was after the Beatles. So, but anyway, here's here's the thing that I that's interesting to me about particularly I should have known better because I think prior to the release of the film. That was the thing that they used to release to uh, news media, so to use to promote the film. So that was the first thing you saw of A Hard Day's Night, in oh, my no, memory. I, I should have known better. It was I should have known oh, better, oh, because they were clearly not in a normal playing context, so they were, there they were in the guard van or whatever it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, playing cards with Wilfred Bramble and, uh, and, and Patty Boyd looking on and so forth. And then, as you say, uh, instruments materialised and so forth. And it was just an ideal song to use to, to, to trail the film. The thing that strikes me whenever I watch Hard Days now, Nowadays is I, I find a lot of the kind of comedy faintly tiresome. But the one thing that utterly endures in the film are the film performances of the group. And they they are just absolutely fantastic, and I think what Dick Lester did in in making those films was um, was kind of unconsciously, without knowing, he invented pop video. I don't think he, he knew he was he doing it at all. Um, and the one thing he'd do whenever he shot them performing a a number is he would put it put like five, six, seven cameras on it, you know, so he picked up absolutely everything. And then when he edited things together, you didn't just get them playing a song. You got them responding to each other. And so a huge amount of what you see in those Dick Lester film performances from Hard Day's Night is reaction shots between them. It's the looks between them. It's the looks between them. And the harmonies. Absolutely. And the and so what he did and I, you know, I speak as somebody who saw Hard Day's Night three three times, you know, in, in a row, the, the Dewsbury Pioneer in 1964 when it came out, like most teenagers did at the time. And it was the first time you'd ever seen anything like that, certainly on a large screen. And you, the first time you'd seen anything that celebrated the idea of a group and celebrated the idea of friendship, and that's what it, it really, you know, winningly it presented to people. And that was what people just couldn't get enough of, is that these guys, there they were, having an absolute ball, you know. And, and Lester's cameras 
don't just film them from the front. They kind of get inside the group. So you, it's almost as if you're the fifth member in the middle there trying to catch the eye of the other four. And I think that's the thing that he did that nobody had done before. So you look at earlier performances, I don't know, you, do, you look at, you know, Little Richard doing Girl Can't Help It or, or whatever. Uh, uh, you look at the animals, there is, a, there is quite an interesting uh, clip of the animals doing House of the Rising Sun, which was in cinemas at the time, you know, which 1964 again. Oh, that's a wonderful clip. Was that one when the camera goes round behind the, the back of... Um, it, it kind of... Re- it, I think it... But it's, it's just around. one camera. I think it's yeah, one camera. It it's got them absolutely static, and then the camera kind of moves, moves and, in order to pick up all of them. Yeah. Whereas the difference between that and Dick Lester's presentation of I Should Have Known Better or, or anything from A Hard Day's Night, is absolutely night and day in in cinema terms. You know, the liveliness, the looseness of, of the way that Lester's cameramen shot that. And he obviously let them do that. You know, a certain amount of his hand held. Well, I don't think people were doing much handheld in those days. You you're know? so right because that scene in the in the um, uh, on the train, it, you're looking at the other members of the Beatles as if you're looking from the point of view of a member of the Beatles. This is it. This uh, is it's it. just extraordinary. And it and was you're it, inside the greatest gang imaginable. And it was the, the, the hard day's night was the greatest advertisement for the magical qualities of the Beatles that was yeah. ever done. Just in those numbers, you know, so you go and look at another case from the same film that I still can't, can never get enough of is one of my favourite Beatles songs, which is If I Fell. Oh, that's a wonderful which song. Which is, they do this. They Aren't do they playing the, it? They look like they're playing it live. No, no, well, they're clearly not. But so there they are in the television theatre. They've gone in there. They've got to go do a camera rehearsal or whatever. And they're, they're taking the mickey out of Ringo and his drums, you know. And, and so that becomes the way of moving from dialogue into a, into a number. And so John starts off singing it sort of teasingly to Ringo, you know, if I fell in love with you, would you promise to be true, whatever. And Ringo kind of goes away from him and then sits down at the drums. And every time I watch it, even 60 years later, I'm always thinking the same thing. Is he going to get to the drums in time? Because he comes in with that, you know, on the second verse or whatever. And I've thought ever since I was 13 years old, he won't get there in time. <laughs> he won't get there in time. And I still feel it when I watch it to this day. And, and uh, you know, the amount of love that was put into by Dick Lester in the edit, in putting that stuff together, is just absolutely remarkable to this day. So I don't think he realised that, well, clearly he didn't realise that, you know, 20 years later there would be... TV channels devoted to to putting out clips of bands playing their latest songs twenty four hours a day. Didn't see didn't see that at all. It seems the complete blueprint. Actually, the track I was thinking of was "And I Love Her." Do you remember that one in the film? It's fantastic all right. with George playing the acoustic guitar solo, which I think possibly was live for the film. I don't know, but it's just just breathtaking. But anyway, I feel another of the the many things that the Beatles invented. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Yesterday's news today. I was reading this piece in the London Review of Books. You see, in the absence of the record mirror, this is what we're used to in this day and age. Go on, carry on. And very happily so. There's a, a, a fantastic piece about Tom Verlaine, which I didn't know this. He had 50,000 books. <laughs> 50,000 books, which he had assembled. He li- it's, it's such an interesting piece. We should put a little... Um, Linked to it actually at the bottom of this uh, this podcast. Such an interesting with twenty tons of books. He lived, I think, alone in a one bedroom apartment. Clearly, very contented. Very that was guy. that was the first thing that really gave me pause when I read this piece. I couldn't believe that Tom Verlaine lived alone. I know, I know. I would have thought he would have been married probably no, many he never times. Got married. 
You know, got married. I actually looked this up after reading it, and the only indication I could see of a relationship was with Patty Smith briefly, wasn't it? Oh, really? In the early 70s, oh, yeah. Wow. But otherwise, didn't appear to be. He was obviously a completely self contained individual. Very, very eccentric. They talked about how he never gave up smoking, he always wore a car coat. He also described as being like a character from a film noir, and he never took cabs. And so, in order to get his books, and he, he bought, when they were on tour, in between sound check and gig, he would go off to bookshops or whatever, and old bookshops, and try and just and buy up books, 20 tonnes of books, 50,000 volumes. And he kept them in five different stores, uh, big storage units in New York. And it said he never took cabs. So what he would do is take a grocery cart when he got a load of, uh, of new books, load up the grocery cart, wheel it to the F train, get on the F train and then get off the F train. And, and for the last stretch, he would go across seven lanes of traffic to take the books to the warehouses. And I just thought, what an absolutely extraordinary guy. He also had an incredible collection of um, kind of valve amps, didn't he? Of old bits oh, of right. yeah, analog yeah, yeah. equipment. He would buy up all sorts of stuff. And uh, there's some really amazing bits. There's one bit made me think of you telling a story about beef art, I think, where he had this incredible hearing. And he would, there was a sound check once, and he said, I can hear this buzzing somewhere in the, in the building. And they all turned off their gear and they couldn't hear anything. And they turned everything absolutely quiet. And somebody wandered around. Eventually they could find. He said, no, it's over there. It's over there in that corner. And they could find this little buzzing. And he, I think you once interviewed Beefheart. He I said, did. didn't he say in the interview that I, I can hear some noise? He stopped in the middle of the interview. This is BBC um, studio, <coughs> the old Langham studio. Yeah, yeah, across, yeah. Which is down the hotel. Um, and he said in the middle of it, we must have a tape of this. Trevor Dan, who, who I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure Trevor yeah. produced it. Trevor's probably still got the original tape. Trevor, if you have, and you're listening to this, get in touch. We'd love to hear it. Um, because Beefheart just stopped in the middle of an answer. And yeah. he says, there's noise. There's noise. In here. And and nobody could tell what he was going on about at all. But then when they listened back Someone to the was tape, using it was, toothbrush, <laughs> was a answer. noise. It yeah, was yeah. a noise, you know. The, the, the certain, it's, it's kind of um, it's very good for your reputation if you're yeah. a kind of out there musician like Tom Verlaine or or Captain Beefheart to, what to for people to think you have a weird hearing. Yes. Yeah, it is. What a wildly eccentric guy! I, the, I like the idea of being on the train. You know, there you are going on a tube. You know, you know, we don't call them tubes, subways or whatever. Yeah, you're going home back home to Queens or whatever. It's the middle of the afternoon. And the train stops, and on gets Tom Verlaine. Tom Verlaine in his, in his old car coat, <laughs> skinny the, little guy with a cigarette on the go, pushing a great teetering trolley full of, <clears throat> of dusty old paperbacks. Absolutely amazing, and just books on every single imaginable subject. I thought it was really interesting, and I think he genuinely did did read them. I mean, I don't think it was just a sort of uh, compulsive collecting thing. But they had a big auction of them last year. All fifty thousand books sold. What an interesting guy! And also, did he that, sign his name inside them? That would be good. To oh, say. I don't he know. got a copy of good. you know yeah. uh, PG Woodhouse book. With, but this book belongs to Tom Belay. Tom <laughs> Ex Libris. Tom <laughs> Belay. <Yeah. laughs> Little rubber stamp. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, I, I can't help but think that there is a connection between the fifty thousand books and the fact that he wasn't married. Possibly. You know. If, if there had been a, another human being in there, they would have said, now, come on, this yeah. is just stupid. Mate, it's gone far enough. Well, although all that happens in our house is, is my wife just um, has given up trying to get me to get rid of things. She just, uh, if there's anything she, she doesn't immediately have a place for, she just puts it up here. You know, and I come into this room where I work at the top of the house. And she's out of the further pile. Like she can't get rid of them herself, so she's going to blame them on me. You know, leave me to deal with them. That's really funny. <laughs> That's a great ruse. I think I'm just sweeping something under the carpet, it really dump it in David's room. Yes, that's the way it goes. Yeah. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit. From this next bit. I think we were talking recently about um, this week in, or a recent week in 1974, being a particularly great 
week for the release of albums because it had um, Todd Rundgren, Todd, and um, Big Stars Radio City, wasn't it? And and Press Logic. <laughs> Press yeah. Logic. All the same anything. week, weren't they? All the same week. And uh, how that contrasts with this week in March 1984, to pick one at random, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> and so these were the... These were the reasons why you might have been skipping down to your local R Price or HMV or Virgin with a song in your heart and possibly a record token from your antique, you know, in your back pocket. Do you ever used to get a record token for Easter? We did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you did. When, when, once, uh, once, um, indulgent ants got realized it was no longer the thing to do to buy you an Easter egg, they would give you a record token. Very useful. So it was a and listen. That was a great thing. Anyway, this week in in March nineteen eighty four. Here we go. This is Spinal Tap by Spinal Tap. Uh, the album. The irony here is that's almost the best record in this entire chart <laughs> by a group by a group pretending to be not even a real group. I'm not sure that isn't the best record. But anyway, carry on. This is okay. Spinal Tap. Is your is your heart going pitter patter at the prospect of going and buying About Face by David Gilmour? I'm not I don't sure think it is, is it? No. no? And uh, similar to Rising Force by I can't even say Ingui this. Ingwie Molstein. Ingwie Molstein. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> but well, Howard on. Jones is human's lip. I mean, he was the. I'm sure not about because we were at Smash Hits. I was at Smash Hits at the time, and I don't remember that being terrible. But the point is, it's Howard Jones. Did any was was the sky black with chapeau at the concept of any Howard Jones single? Not necessarily. I wouldn't so. have thought so. Even no. on the trendier side, you yeah. know, the more the more indie side, I've got um, Strange Romeos by the Hoodoo Gurus, yeah. which I think I've probably got somewhere. And I think it probably had since 1984. And I think I can say, without fear of contradiction, I don't think I've ever played it. No, probably not bad. Uh, it's probably not bad. As was, uh, I'm again informed because I don't think I remember li- listening to it myself, but Marillion's Fugazi. Surely it was <laughs> quite a well known record. It was. Is that the one yeah. that had a hit on it? Um, it probably did. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then uh, Love Life by Berlin. And it just goes on, Heartbeat City by The Cars. You know, that it's kind of past their big hits, isn't it, really? It's a body that, that, by Joe Jackson, the same, too, because his first it two is. were the big ones. When they look sharp and I'm your man. And Great it's record. Su- it's such an interesting contrast with... Um, you know, if you, if you looked at a, at a month in 1964 or a month in 1974, you would have found generally... People doing their kind of earlier and better records, you know, because people weren't signed to particularly long deals in those days. Yeah. Whereas, come the eighties, the, the amount of money being made, you know, the a group like the Cars are being signed for kind of five albums or whatever, even though they probably only got songs for one. You know what I mean? So the, there's yeah. a lot of a lot of lot kind of filler. quota filling here, isn't there? Yeah. And yeah, and inevitably, you know, you've got Alchemy, Dire Straits Live. Well, obviously, you know, Dire Straits was still a really huge deal and so forth. And so they had a live album. Somebody, you know, it was going to get put out. Cafe Blur by the Style Council. Is that a particularly distinguished Style Council? Record? Actually, I remember that being reasonably good at the time. Okay. The Style Council, were, I thought, were, were, you know. They're hardly applauded now, but they were, at the time they were quite exciting. Weren't they okay. style cancelled when we were on Smash Hits? Oh, Suddenly yeah. It was videos of them in punts on the in Cambridge <laughs> and wearing punts. espadrilles <laughs> and shorts. Smoking gauze. Paul, Paul, yeah, smoking gauze and Paul with a kind of, you know, pastel uh, sweaters draped around his shoulder. Yes, Chris Cross. Quite a departure from uh, yes, yeah. the jam. Yeah. So it goes on, Talk Show by the Go-Go's, um, The Dungeons I'm Calling by Savatage, The Icicle Works by The Icicle Works. Who, to be fair, had a good track. Do you remember Love is a Wonderful Colour? That's a great record. Is that on Sorry. that record? Oh, okay. I'm sure it is. It All right, okay, yeah. fine. And the most significant thing I can find from this entire month, March uh, 1984 is the release a record that I don't even have, but I'm I know it was very significant. Is Run DMC? 
Yeah, their first song. I don't have any big hits on it, but it was, I mean, they were a big deal, weren't they? They, they, I mean, they were just, just starting out, weren't they? They were that. They were a huge deal, certainly yeah, for the, re- yeah. the rest of the decade. So you know, March nineteen eighty four. We're having it. We're 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 calling it, as they say, the dullest month <laughs> in the history of popular music. And if you know better. Get in touch. The Word Podcast. Two cocoa tins and a piece of string. Do you know what all the great records have in common, Mark? Go on. Try me. You've already got them. You already own them. But you just haven't played them for ages. Yeah. And I had a case of this the other day. When something moved me to listen to an artist who I haven't listened to for ages called J.J. Kale. Oh, he's a love J.J. Oh, Lord. Alex, have you even heard J.J. Kale? I have heard of J.J. Kale, but I've never actively listened to J.J. Kale. Wow, that's extraordinary. We went to see J.J. Kale uh, at the Hammersmith Odeon. Oh, I um, at, the, uh, at the time, probably of naturally would it have been called with the breeze mm-hmm. and cocaine. And I can remember we were sitting in the fourth row and it took us about five minutes to work out which one was J.J. Kale. Well, because they started with an he, instrumental. He didn't sing for he the He didn't first sing, and he was sitting. I don't months. remember him sitting at the front either. He sat at the side, and my wife, at the time girlfriend, said to me, leaned over and said, which one's J.J. Kale? That's right, I asked her. And, and, and he was me, wearing a cap. me being very knowing and slightly superior said, he's not on yet. And you must have felt pretty ridiculous. I was made to look at full about three minutes later. (laughs) When he leaned to high and low. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, anyway, here's the story of JJ Kale, Alex. No longer with us. Died a little while ago. Um, JJ Kale came from Oklahoma. I did Glenn Campbell and, uh, and, uh, oh, did Glenn Campbell come from Oklahoma? No, I think I'm wrong about that. Leon Russell came from Oklahoma, all sorts of people. Um, and he, he was born just before the, just before the last war, I think. And, uh, he, he, um, built his own home studio as a teenager. This is in the fifties. Yeah, which I would say you have to be quite advanced to do that in the 1950s. Quite a feat. Yeah. And then he goes off, he goes, he is a musician and he goes off and works in, in, in Los Angeles, engineering sessions and playing occasionally and, uh, tries to make it as a kind of, uh, uh, as a musician, puts out, uh, a, a song of his, his called it After Midnight in 1966 and it does nothing at all. Uh, and then he kind of buggers off back to Oklahoma. And meanwhile, in the late sixties, uh, Eric Clapton makes his first solo album and hears After Midnight and does his own version of After Midnight and it, it's a kind of hit. It's a big radio hit. So J.J. Kale back in Tulsa or whatever suddenly thinks, hang on, <laughs> suddenly then my career's happened. I've got to keep at this. <laughs> I've got to keep yeah. at this. And so, you know, makes uh, makes records, you know, uh, that we should put out under the name J.J. Kale because his name was John Kale and somebody's decided it was not a good idea for confusion uh, from the from the point of view of uh, potential confusion. Such a uh, good name, J.J. Kale, too. Yeah, absolutely. There's sort of mystery about it. Absolutely. And so he, he made all these records that were, you know, quite big hits because he just had a very distinctive sound, which people always used to say, we used to it, Accused of being laid back, you know what I mean. The the idea that JJ Kale made his records with no effort whatsoever, that they were all, you know, they were all conceived and delivered on a, on a on a kind of on a on a, on a porch, you know what I mean, with, with probably a, a pitcher of lemonade on yeah. one side and with somebody a, asleep in a hammock, just somebody to asleep in a hammock, yeah, and a fan slowly going round and whatever. And he did this for years. And what fascinates me about J.J. Kale and what became utterly clear to me the other day when I started listening to a load of J.J. Kale for the first time ever is, is that they, they, they have a really narrow range and yet they're immensely satisfying. You know what I mean? We always tend to think that we always tend to judge artists by, you know, how, how broad they are. 
Whereas actually, you know, what works in pop music is very often narrowness. And J.J. Kelly is unbelievably narrow, but endlessly inventive within that very, very narrow range. And because... Clearly, because he started life as an engineer. And so these are really put together records. You know, that they're not just jamming. They're not people on a porch at all. He's really thought about exactly how they're going to sound, they're how the rhythmization is going to sound. All the little, arranged. the little details of all the instruments that come in are absolutely extraordinary. Absolutely. And, and of course, the interesting thing, I, I think I've mentioned this before, his, so his, his, his breakthrough is 1971. And so there are two records in 1971 in America that are big hits that use for the first time automated rhythm, i.e. not a drummer. It's just a very, very basic little rhythm machine. And one is a family affair by Sly and the Family Stone, which from which millions of things, you know, proceed. And the other is Call Me the Breeze by JJ Kale. You know, which which you always think of as the as the polar opposite of a family affair. But no, it started in the same way, which is let's get a rhythm track, uh, you know, from a, a really cheap little rhythm box and let's build on top of it. You can sort of hear it too, though, can't you? Oh, you can hear it. You can definitely hear it at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just ticky away like a metronome, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. There's something unusual about it. It's really clever. But the level of invention from J.J. Kale, you know, over a period of whatever it was, 30 years they made, re- made records, is just absolutely astonishing. So I wanted to raise my hat, tip the hat, is the more appropriate expression, to... Artists who have really narrow ranges but are really great. Have you got a, a nomination in this category, Mark Allen? Oh, I've got, well, I've got, yeah, I have actually. I mean, I was thinking about the Ramones, but the Ramones, is, they're, they're not that similar. They don't have a particular sound all the way through. Well, they do to some extent, but there's a bit of variety. But the one I thought of was the Fabulous Thunderbirds. I used to love the Fabulous Thunderbirds, and they made countless records, but the first 10 years... They made seven albums with Kim Wilson singing and playing the harp, do you remember? And Jimmy Vaughan, Stevie Ray Vaughan's brother, as the guitar player. And there, I think there's something really... Tra- and those first seven records have a kind of quality about them which is really comforting to me. They all sound the same. They're a kind of Texan blues band, an R&B, and it's got swamp blues, and their big influences were uh, were Slim Harpo and Lazy Lester, and there's something very attractively behind the beat about it. Jimmy Vaughan always plays just a little bit slow and just a little bit behind what's going on. And there's just something very comforting and unurgent and and backward leaning and just relaxing. It's like a, like putting on an old coat, you know. And I find that those uh, if there's if there's a if you want some kind of sense of comfort to go back and listen to those early fabulous Thunderbirds records is terrific for me. I love them. And also beautiful sleeves. Oh God, they're wonderful. I'm going to do that because I've got some. Yeah, yeah. they're wonderful old room, sleeves. I haven't listened to the fabulous Thunderbirds in a long, long time. Just right. a lovely again, totally. I'm using the word laid back. Thank very, you. very relaxed, supine sound. So, Alex, have you got anything to to offer in this category? Somebody who's got a really narrow range, but you still like? I do. Um, actually, I've got I've got two offerings. If that, if that's okay. Um, yeah. The first one. I don't know if you'll agree with this, but to my ears, at least, um, you two have never strayed far at all from a very distinct formula. Oh. Um, I don't think. Now, I might be. I'm no expert on you two's catalog. Maybe disco tech's a little bit different, but they've never really done anything sonically radical. It's always that you've got the four to the floor, like Larry Mullen drum beat. Yeah. You've got Bono's kind of roaring thing going on. You've got Edge's two note motif. And it's always that kind of thing. It's a bit like the sonic version of getting into your parents' car after a school trip. You know, it's just... <laughs> it's just yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. As you, did your mum used to meet you? This is so interesting. 
Were you one of those children whose mum used to pick them up from school and made sure she had some food with her? Did you? Were you one of those children who always got into the car after school? I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to give them a sandwich, I otherwise to, they would have started a riot. I'd have to wait till I got home. But, uh, oh, right, but, but, okay. but my sister does that with her kids. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's, it's okay. always several snacks. Emergency any food supply. No, I mean, you you two is a very good, a very good thought actually, a very good addition. Don't, but they, don't they have a little bit of variety? You do you compare those early records to stuff after Act and Baby? They're quite different, aren't they? I, th- I think they settled into a style. There is a U two style. Yeah, you know there there is. You don't go to U two looking for surprise, do you? Yeah. It, it really, you know, you would be jolted if there were any surprise. You know, it's it's quite a you two in their way are kind of as 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 narrow as Jimmy Reed or something like yes. that. Yes, as the ink spots. You know, the ink spots, of course, as we've said before. And if you've never done this before, go and away and try it after this podcast. Go on Spotify or wherever and just play. The Ink Spots greatest hit, greatest hits, and just play the first ten seconds of every track. They're literally, they're exactly the same, identical, they completely, are. absolutely. You don't know which song it's going to be? Totally the same. It's like Chuck Berry, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's more, more than Chuck Berry. Yeah, Chuck yeah. Berry was identical. Chuck Berry was Frank Zappa compared to the Ink Spots. <laughs> so, so uh, Alex, what's your other nomination? My other nomination, it's a little bit of a different thing, but I still think it's it's relevant in its own way, and that's that's Johnny Marr. Um, okay who has a very in his i mean he's he's relentlessly creative of course and very prolific but he's got a very distinct way of playing that hasn't really changed over the course of 40 years in fact he's the only guitarist i can think of who i don't think's ever been on record playing a guitar solo oh um and there's, well, there's that's interesting hmm. Because he didn't uh, play any in the Smiths, did he? No, and he, he'll never bend a note either. Yeah. I don't think there's any examples of him bending a guitar string to create a, um, another note. Uh, so he's Does very, Peter you know, Buck ever play solos? Oh, that's a good point. Peter Buck. Know. Oh, do you know, this is good. This is good stuff. I never this thought. This is interesting. I, you know, I never thought about that with Johnny Moe. I was thinking of this charming man, which I know absolutely every... And it's all a rhythm track, isn't it? A very, very complicated rhythm track. He'll make use of chords and arpeggios and two-note motifs, but he'll never play a traditional guitar solo. Actually, yeah, I think Peter Buck's quite similar. I, I'd say Peter Buck's probably yeah, he the, is. the closest there is to a, a, an American counterpart to Johnny Marr. So I'm yeah. going to take this a little bit further. Is this why we no longer have the cult of the guitar hero? Because guitarists don't play solos anymore. Is that right? Well, they must do, but maybe they don't make such a big song and dance about it because it used to be. Now the spotlight's on me, isn't it? Sit back, everybody. I, hmm, I Did Johnny Marr make it unfashionable? I don't think it's ever been in or out of fashion. I just think it's the way that music has gone. Uh, that, you know, the, the cult with the guitar hero. I think it emerged at a time where, where being a guitarist was seen as, you know, following on from a discussion last week, quite aspirational. You know, the key to a better life, whereas. Whereas now it ain't that. No. <laughs> <laughs> <Not> <laughs> no, you'll be on the on the on the very edges of solvency within twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh, my son, my son's a lead guitarist. Oh, I am sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry, dear. It's like saying my son's a poet or something. Is that right? Yeah, oh dear. Yes. Yeah, what do you do yeah, for a living? Yeah, it's the that's the old joke. Yeah, you know, I, I work in advertising. Don't tell my mother. She thinks I play the piano, play the piano in, a in a brothel. brothel. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by the Word. 